Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you so much. Ah, oh, this is this is spectacular. I've been at Harvard Medical School for 35 plus years. I've never been to the opening of a movie. This is really exciting. I'm really disappointed though. Where's the popcorn? Somebody, somebody can fix that maybe. We will, I believe there will be a reception at the end. It, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm George Daly. I'm the relatively new dean of Harvard Medical School. Um, it is such an honor, such an incredible honor for me tonight to be introducing Bending the Ark. This is a film that proves what an amazing difference individuals can make in changing this world. The story begins with a group of idealistic young friends who started an organization called Partners in Health. Their work, which begun over 30 years ago, was dedicated to saving lives in a tiny Haitian community. But it planted the seeds that have grown into a movement that is now flourishing around the world. And together, they help transform our notions of what we all believe is possible in modern medicine. We are very privileged at Harvard Medical School that two of the co-founders featured in the film are alums of this institution and are among our most distinguished and honored alumni, the type of alumni that, that bring honor to the school, not the other way around. And they are here tonight. They will be joining us um, after the movie for a discussion of the film and commentary on their life's work. Jim Kim, Jim Young Kim is president of the World Bank Group and Paul Farmer, the Calicatrones University professor at Harvard. Two of the titans in the world of global health and both Jim and Paul received their MDs, their PhDs in anthropology from Harvard in the early 1990s and that was after, <laughs> that was after they had actually already started Partners in Health. Both of them have been professors here at Harvard Medical School. Both of them have uh, taken turns leading now uh, what's known as the Medical School's Department of Global Health and Social Medicine. But uh, as impressive as these job titles and accomplishments, these two are clearly much more than the sum of their resumes. Jim and Paul are absolute forces of nature. They are unleashing their unmatched energy, their hard-won wisdom, their deeply held sense of the value of all human life to insist tirelessly that world-class healthcare is not just a human right, but a real possibility that can be delivered for people everywhere. Astoundingly, they have also done the work that needs to be done to begin to make that vision a reality in very different ways, following very, very different career paths. It's not just grinding out the hours in often crushingly difficult clinical conditions or attempting to change the course of monolithic international bureaucracies, and we hope to hear about that. It's brilliant, creative work that finds solutions where most others are simply seeing problems. When they started out struggling to deliver care in places without hospitals, without medication, without doctors, they were never without hope and they were never alone. And from the beginning, Partners in Health developed a way of working that emphasized deep collaboration and partnership. In cities and towns, villages around the world, they work with local people who they help to train as community health workers who then accompany patients on their journeys from illness to health. They also nurture deep relationships 
with people at institutions such as Harvard Medical School, where our scholars and our teachers contribute to their work, conducting crucial research that deepens our collective understanding of disease by helping us find the best ways to deliver care, and also by training the next generation of leaders in global health. Without partnerships like these, we at Harvard couldn't do the kind of work we do to advance understanding of infectious disease and eradicate it, or develop new diagnostic tools, or make real the vision of universally available safe surgery. And that's to name just a few of the ambitious goals that we share. Jim and Paul are two of my heroes. They are what makes this community so spectacular. They are an inspiration, and I don't think I'm alone in finding the power of that inspiration in the work that they have done and they began three decades ago in Haiti. I'm sure that this film will inspire all of us so that we can rededicate ourselves to bringing health to all the world's people. Let's look forward to bending the arc. Thank you. I want to ask uh, Paul and Jim to join us uh, to discuss the film and their work to capture some of the insights. Thank you, thank you. Well, so much, so many lessons to take home. I'm, I'm immediately impressed by how much it reminds us what it means to be dedicated to human health. I also, I'm just so impressed that neither of you have aged at all. <laughs> Very funny, George. Wow. I, I, we will have uh, some comments from the audience. I just want to start. I think one of the things which is so, so surprising and so revealing about the two of you is that you've always been moved by a common passion all humans are human, and that you wanted to, to serve the needs. But then you've taken such different paths in your lives, such different paths, so impactful, but so different. Paul, living at that interface of academia and, and service, always the clinician, and Jim, realizing that to move mountains, one has to engage in these major institutions, the World Health Organization or the World Bank, both impactful in such dramatic ways. What, if we would start, what is the, the one lever that you pull, the one major tool that you've both used in your careers that comes back again and again as that force that allows you to have the impact that you have. Paul well, or Jim, can what? I, yeah, let me, let me, uh, can you guys hear me? It's not working. Okay. It's now working. Is that better? Can you hear me? Okay. 
Um, you know, the thing, George, I would say is that, I don't know if Paul would say the same, but it doesn't feel like we've been going down different paths at all. I mean, I, I don't know uh, if, if you feel that way, but I, um, uh, you know, like the Ebola thing, um, if I, I, I did what I, better? Okay. I, I, uh, I did what I always did, which is uh, if something's going on, I call Paul. And uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, in, uh, in global health, and you know, just got a view of what was happening, that made it clear to me that um, that uh, you know that we had to act. But I think the thing that, th and it didn't really, I don't, I don't even know that we talked about it in the film, but um, uh, this notion of areas of moral clarity, based on this uh, even um, uh, even more profound notion of making a preferential option for the poor. That's guided everything uh, we've ever done. And so um, making a preferential option for the poor meant that uh, there really was no boundary. And so I've just kept pursuing it in the same way now. You know, the, the, the we set a goal nine months into my tenure at the World Bank Group that we were actually going to end extreme poverty by 2030. And um, uh, it, it, it doesn't feel like um, uh, we've taken different paths and followed a, a different sort of um, uh, uh, signal or, or goal, but it just feels like we've taken the same goal and taken it to different institutions. Yeah. That's what yeah. it feels like to me. Yeah, I mean, we, we, because we went to school together right here, you guys were classmates, yes. serves, um, we talked a lot about this, probably too much. Um, but that was, that's part of, you know, being socialized uh, as a professional and, and uh, as students, and, and of course, we were talking with uh, we were we were moving between radically different worlds. Um, and you mentioned areas of moral clarity, um, AMC, not the theater, but academic medical centers are really central to this. Now, the two ideas that Jim mentioned, um, you know, we did the MD PhD program here. Our, some of our teachers in the room, um, we were both passionate about. Um, the world, I mean, that sounds kind of strange, but we were interested in, in the world around us. We'd come from, in some ways, very different backgrounds. My mother is not a philosopher, theologian, let's put it that way. But, um, and yet, we, it was easy, as is often, often the case here, right? You, 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 you come to a place like this, and uh, you strike up friendships easily. And when you can be bound together by such powerful ideas, which we discovered either in books or in hospitals or by listening to people. You know, doctors and anthropologists are both supposed to be pretty good at that. Now, that is often not the case, right? That, you know, but reverent auditions, which isn't natural to either of us, sorry, right? Uh, but, but forcing yourself to, to listen kept on bringing, back, bringing us back to uh, these first principles, as Jim likes to say. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll never forget that we were at a meeting and we were just, just fighting it out with these folks. They were saying, no, it's not cost effective to do this. It's not cost effective to do that. And they were saying, no, you can't possibly think that there'd be money to do that. And, and they just kept setting lines in the sand of where you, you know, you can't possibly go past this. And as we were walking out the room, Paul said to me, God, aren't we lucky to have O for the P? Because for us, we didn't get confused by all these things that, that sure, you know, you can say there's not enough money, but God, there's plenty of money in the world. I mean, you know, and now, um, I, you know, we just, uh, uh, we, we, uh, we, we loaned and provided grants of about $65 billion last uh, year. You could give some of that to me, please. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and, and you know, $65 billion in the world so is, is not even. doesn't pay any attention <laughs> <is not> at all. <laughs> <laughs> Problem. There's no reverent audition there. <laughs> But the, the point is that if you want to end extreme poverty, 65 billion is not even touching the problem. It's, a, it's a, just a tiny fraction. And so we're now thinking, okay, so, so if you really do want to end extreme poverty, well, what do you really have to do? And um, now we're, you know, we're doing all kinds of things. And I keep talking about you know, rich people use these tools, swaps and, and, and debt and leverage and equity. They use them every day to make themselves wealthier. At the World Bank Group now, we're trying to use those things on behalf of poor people. So if I can just give you one update. I was so incensed by what happened with Ebola, because I said, why is there not an automatically dispersing instrument that would have immediately dispersed when it got dangerous for the world? 
and uh, because we had to wait. We were the very first organization, group, entity to provide any financing for Ebola. And then I think basically out of shame, uh, other countries came after us. But we, we, pu we put 400 million on the table right away. And I was just incensed because there should have been something that would kick in right away. So guess what? We created an insurance instrument. Did you name it after me? <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's called the PEF. Paul Edward Farmer. No, it, it's, called, <laughs> it's called the Pandemic Emergency Facility. And I actually... <laughs> I Can I say one thing, George, though, it started, about the... It started. About the but l let me just explain. No, so, no, me. So, <laughs> yeah. so what, we, what I did was I went to the insurance companies and I said, look, you know, a pandemic must be terrible for you guys because you have to pay out a lot of money after pandemic start. And they said, oh, my God, thanks for coming by. Because we never get to be I, part. I rarely get that kind of treatment <laughs> yeah. at the insurance company. <laughs> I said, we never get to participate in global health discussions, but we're so worried about pandemics. And I said, well, why wouldn't we be able to go to the capital markets and raise hundreds of millions of dollars and tell everybody, look, we're going to pay you a high interest rate on, on, this, uh, on the money you give us, but you could lose it all. But if you lose it all, it would be in the service of stopping a pandemic. And they said, oh, you know, it can't be done, can't be done. And, uh, once again, you know, naysayers everywhere. And we literally forced infectious disease doctors, modelers, and the insurance companies to sit in a room for six months. We came up with a likelihood of, of a pandemic event happening for three major viruses. And d just this past July, I did what, in, what they call the bond call. I did the bond call myself. We raised $450 million, first time in history. Now we finally, for the first time, have an automatically dispersing instrument that if the 75 poorest countries in the world are faced with either flu virus, coronavirus, or phylovirus, we would have as much as $450 million dispersing immediately. So we've never stopped. So you know, now that we've started with, uh, with the pandemic insurance, the next question is, well, why don't we have famine insurance? Why don't we, have, why don't we share risk with the capital markets like all rich people do and just completely wipe out the specter of famine in the world. So I, it's never stopped. We've, we've never stopped pursuing uh, the same goal. It's just that I have um, uh, a few extra tools. Pulling to different levers. I want to add something Pulling that. different levers. I want to add something to that, and, I, and especially to the students who are here. Um, I hate meetings. Uh, I really love clinical medicine, and I really love academic medicine. I mean, I, I was. Um, from the minute I got here, um, I've loved it here, and I've loved it at the Brigham, right? And you know, if you if you look, really, I wasn't joking about AMCs, academic medical centers. They do three things that a lot of uh, institutions, certainly universities, are very ambivalent about. That is, they take care of sick people, including the poor. They train others to do so, and they generate new knowledge, research. So we actually use that notion. Uh, along with the ideas that Jim mentioned, preferential option for the poor, which I agree, Jim, that's, that kept us from being too confused, yeah. right? Just like, it's so basic. Do you, I mean, do you really believe people have the same value or that some are less valuable than others? And, you know, viruses and microbes, they don't respect nation states. They didn't sign the Treaty of Westphalia, yeah. you know? And, and so we, we, did, we do, and there's a lot of our colleagues in the room today, our teachers, as I said, but also our colleagues from Partners in Health who are faculty members here at, at Harvard Medical School, trained at Harvard School of Public Health, they're in the teaching hospitals. Um, and we, so we tell our trainees and our friends, you know, you should do the part of this important work that you most like to do. And for me, that was clinical medicine and, and field work. But, I learned a lot from Jim and, you, and others. You saw Jaime Bayona, mm -hmm. um, uh, um, Agnes Benaguajo is on the faculty of HMS. She was here last night. These are people who are pursuing what they like to do, you know, which is policy work that is going to make it less likely that so many people are going to either just crash to the ground or slip through a safety net. And, um, you know, I, I, I have to admit, Jim, Jim's also taught me not to be too skeptical about the claims made uh, in such institutions. I'm still skeptical, but so is he, right? For example, you can change a policy, but that's just the beginning. After that, you actually have to do something, right? So the commitments of the World Bank 
for uh, pandemic pre preparedness, just to stick with the example, or the commitments made in the pledging conference that, that Jim is mentioning in 2014, I'll bet you that no more than 20% of them were ever those promises were kept. And you certainly don't see them trickle down through national institutions, which is what the Rwandans insisted on, into poor communities, or it happens very slowly. So the, you know, this is not a victory narrative. You know, watching this film for me, um, this, is, this is, you know, I've seen it, this is the third time. But watching it for me reminds me of how many times we failed, we didn't say otherwise, but also how much remains to be done. Because if there's a world without poverty, there's not gonna be a world without sickness, of course. But in the circles we move, whether in this country or others, poverty is such a potent potentiator of, uh, of suffering um, that we know there's gonna be plenty to do. Um, and I, and I, Jim was quoting Gramsci, by the way. He comes from a very <laughs> academic family. Like, I, I have gone to visit, I've gone over to Jim's apartment when we, we were in grad school or at the Brigham, and he'd be arguing with his mother and they would be, he'd say, no, mom, that's not what Gramsci said. <laughs> I rarely had conversations like that. My family is like, George, yours, George, George. Let's not bring that up, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love in, in your own words, what is, what is to you individually the message of the film and what do you, what do you want the audience to carry away from it. Let me, um, uh, let me start. So I, in, in my current job, I am so, I think you have to hold that right up. Do you, is yours? As usual. <laughs> in, in my current job, um, you know, I'm extremely, extremely worried about um, uh, so many different things. I was just, uh, earlier today, I was at a, at a climate change conference um, in, uh, in, in, at Yale. And I tell you, you know, this is a fundamental threat uh, to everybody. You, you, you just, you know, there's not a single African leader who won't tell you that climate change is real and who won't also tell you that you guys in the rich world debate climate change, the boot of climate change is on our neck every day, right? The drought that we're seeing, the floods. When it floods in, in Mozambique, hundreds of people died. There was just a recent flood in Sierra Leone, 500 people died because the roads are not um, uh, uh, weather resilient. Yeah, you were, uh, it Where just, were you? Uh, uh, I was uh, in Washington talking <laughs> about the, <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, the, um, uh, so many things have advanced. And uh, I recently gave a TED talk and, and, the, and the focus of it was that, that everywhere I go, I see aspirations rising. So people can, so many people have access to smartphones that everyone in the world knows how everyone else lives. And so it used to be that um, uh, there were these rich people here and then you know, people didn't have broadband and access to smartphones, but you know, they say in five years, everyone in Africa is gonna have broadband. And so aspirations are rising, expectations are rising, and the quality of education and healthcare is so bad that I worry that country after country after country is gonna fall under fragility, conflict, violence, extremism, and then eventually migration. That's, what, that's, that's the pattern that we could go down. So I, I'm, and, and the thing is, the, the greatest leaders in the world understand this very well. I mean, you know, Chancellor Merkel in Germany is constantly pushing us to do more for Africa, because she's saying, you know, we saw the first wave from the Middle East and North Africa, but just wait till Nigeria uh, uh, collapses. Just wait till uh, you know Ethiopia collapses. Then you know th there's going to be nothing like that, and and it threatens the livelihoods of uh, the, the 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 fundamental way of life of Europeans. Now you know I wish that they had come to this realization before that, but this is happening very very quickly. So um, for me, you know, uh, if we don't get much much better at doing the things that Paul's talking about, at offering people all the you know, health care at being much better at, at education. We're putting out a report, our World Development Report this year is in education. In Tanzania, 70% of third graders who've been in school cannot read a simple declarative sentence. Right? Uh, 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 the level of childhood stunting in India is 38%. And I've told the leaders there, you cannot go into a future where probably over 60% of your currently existing jobs are gonna be eliminated 
and think you can complete, compete in a digital economy when 40% of your workforce is not going to be able to, to compete at all. So there are so many signs out there that are so worrisome. And the only solution, the only solution is a kind of new approach to radical egalitarianism where people have access to health care, people have access to education. And if we don't do it, if we don't do it, the result is going to be a very unstable world. A, a number of people now begin to understand it. But the, the, the discourse you're hearing is completely different. You know, if we just think about our own nation, if we just think about our own people, our own race, our own religion, if we just do that more, then we'll be safe. It just nothing could be farther from the truth. So uh, I, I tell you, I, I worry about this intensively. We're trying to, you know, to do everything we can to move uh, money uh, to, to, to poor countries and regions. We're trying to create jobs. But it's, it's going to get very intense, because what you saw in the Arab Spring was very smart people uh, who were unemployed, who had college educations. 52% of college-educated people in Tunisia, uh, where the Arab Spring really had its uh, strongest uh, impact, 52% of college students were unemployed. College graduates were unemployed. Highest rates of unemployment were among the college graduates. They're the ones who started the Arab Spring. You're going to see that everywhere. So I, I think in some ways it's good news. The good news is that if we don't take the path of making a preferential option for the poor, it's going to lead to terrible outcomes. The thing I worry about is that we're going to wait and wait and wait, and this discourse of nationalism and, and, and uh, looking inward is going, to, is going to be around for so long uh, that it'll be too late. And, and, and you, you know, the message hasn't changed, but I think the urgency has just gotten much, much higher. Can I, I just want to yeah. uh -huh. add, you know, um, again, back to the same theme of um, a friend of ours uh, who's, some people call him the, the father of liberation theology, a Peruvian priest named Gustavo Gutierrez, and some of you have, have met him. He, he's always uh, reminding that there are a thousand, there are a thousand ways to, to serve. Yeah. Closer? Yeah, yeah please. Um, and uh, so climate change. Well, I'm going back to Haiti tomorrow. Do, do, I, do I have to get a permission slip from you? Oh, no, you, oh, no, you tenured me. So, um, uh, oh, yeah, that's there's right. that. Um, but, you know, I, the, we, we, so climate change is, uh, you know, I'm, I mean, it's just obvious to anybody who works in Haiti, or I was in Sierra Leone uh, during that mudslide, because that's, a, that's another thing, um, is that, that, again, making that link between the resources that are abundantly, it's abundantly clear they're available in the world, inequality is rising, you know, fewer and fewer, fewer and fewer people have more and more, well, more and more have less and less, which is unstable, as Jim uh, pointed out, and uh, that's really what led to war in West Africa. And sometimes when we're saying, they, mm. when we say rebuild, I mean, after colonialism, they never really built a health system. And the colonial propagandists who said they did were lying. And it, you shouldn't have to go to graduate school to figure that out, right, or medical school. So, you know, these things come together to drive people in the city. In this case, war drove people in the cities. And this happens to be a hilly city like Port-au-Prince. So, of course, every time, every rainy season, and there's 200 inches of rain a year that fall uh, in, in Liberia, say, or there's going to be the same things are going to happen. I, I wish it weren't so, you know, I, and I, uh, but it is. So the implementation area, which, again, Anybody who's a nurse or a doctor or a social worker that is a direct service provider or a community health worker um, it knows, knows that implementation is important, that the ideas can't matter in and of themselves if they're not connected to material change. Now, the two of our teachers here, Byron and Mary Jo Good, um, you know, on, the, on the faculty here, you know, after the, you know, if you look at the tsunami, we were just talking about this in a conference yesterday, the, tsunami, the 2004 tsunami. Um, what ha it, suddenly now the world's attention is focused on the tsunami, but war in, the, in, in, in Indonesia had been going on mm -hmm. for some time. And so these events, Her Harvey, Irma, I was in Haiti for Irma, I'm from Florida, watched it all from Haiti, headed back. I mean, these, these dramatic events like the earthquake, for me, that's like the most, or the Ebola epidemic, particularly the earthquake, they reveal things about the world um, that you can know, 
even without going through such terrible events or without being there, right? Um, and that they certainly expose they ex the vulnerabilities. They the expose system. the vulnerabilities, and I think that's what Jim has been talking about at the policy level. I, you know, and and uh, and that's that's what I like to do. The I'm not going to say pragmatic because it makes it sound like policy is not pragmatic, which I, right. I don't agree. Mm -hmm. you know, it's just a different kind of personal engagement. Well, you both, you both embody the, the core of compassion, the realization of the need for organization, and the dependency on the ability to mobilize resources in, in, in very different ways. We have some uh, microphones here, and we would invite some questions from the audience for a few minutes before we retire to a reception. You can just could line you, up, you could, line you up could, behind them. Please, yeah, yeah, please line up behind the microphones. I see we're going to have more than a few questions here. <laughs> let's, uh, let's start, please. And let's try to please keep your questions brief, and we'll be able to answer more of them. Thanks for that. Uh, seems to me that there's one major force that supersedes all others in the right to equitable health. It is that of capitalistic fervor. Um, health providers and pharma companies stand to profit from treatments, and justifiably so, because otherwise they'd say that their source of income um, or lack of the source of income would jeopardize R&D and newer treatments. But shareholder value seems to be paramount. So how does one fight that behemoth? Well, since uh, shareholder value is not my chief concern, I pass that over to Dr. <laughs> Kim. Look, you know, uh, when, when Paul and I were in graduate school, right, um, there, w there was a real debate. There was a debate about whether uh, the best system was the market system or whether the best system was uh, planned economies that, that traded with each other. But, you know, uh, there's not a single, com a, a, a truly communist country that's open to the world uh, that's not, ha has not completely embraced the market, right? And so uh, at, 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 um, at, a, at a meeting in January, uh, President Xi Jinping stood up and said, look, I'm the president and the head of the largest communist party in the world. And I'm here to tell you that the global market system is the ocean we all swim in, and, the, and any effort to turn it back into lakes and creeks will not work. The key is to make it work for everybody, right? And so uh, if you're talking about drug companies in, in, in particular, right? So, uh, I, you, you know, I, I wish there, there was abundant evidence that uh, lack of a profit uh, motive led to the development of all kinds of drugs that actually uh, uh, had, a, had an impact in the world. It just, it's, it's not been very successful. I mean, Bill and Melinda Gates have had tremendous success in bits and pieces, uh, but without, um, you, you know, it, 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 all you have to do is look at HIV versus TB versus malaria. HIV, there's probably a couple million people in the developed world who are living with it. And so how many medicines we have? 60, 70 medicines? And you know we haven't had uh, we had two new TB drugs in the last 40 years, and we've had like one or two new malaria drugs. So you know, you know the the incentives the incentives have to be aligned to make it work. Now I, I think that you know, my job. So when I go to visit the head of the Vietnamese Communist Party, the only thing he asks me is how can we more effectively create jobs and grow our economy uh, on you know on behalf of the Vietnamese Socialist Party in the context of the market system. I mean, you can, you can cry into the wilderness all you want, but you've got to figure out what, it, what, what is going to make uh, you successful in creating jobs and in, you know, increasing economic growth. Because if you can't do that, uh, the, you know, things go very badly. Look at Venezuela. Right? Look, at, look at Argentina for most of the <coughs> previous 10 years. Uh, you know, they had all kinds of mythologies about what they could do, and the global economy punished them. Right? China, China is... You know, I, I just saw, um, uh, I was just in China when you were in, in, I was in China meeting with the premier, and he said, look, this when is... When I was where, Jim? Yeah, in Sierra Leone. <laughs> and we were, we were thinking about you in Sierra Leone. And he, he said, look, this is Chinese socialism. This is socialism with Chinese features, right? And so uh, I, I think that, that if you take one thing from your medical education, is take an evidence-based approach, right? It's, it's, we, are, we are really, in so many ways, past the age of, age of ideology, and you have to think really hard about, well, what will it, what will it take, what will it actually take for uh, us to, to create a world free of poverty? 
And if you don't think hard about finance, and if you don't think hard about how the market system actually works, I mean, I, look, I, I, I don't expect Paul to do that, right? But, but uh, he's, he's busy with other, th other things. But I have to do that. And, and the leaders of all these countries have to do that. And so for the drug companies, for the drug companies, you can say that if you want, if you have another mechanism to make the kinds of drugs that we need. Now, we, we need them. And, and while I was able to align incentives with the insurance companies for pandemic insurance, it's very hard to align incentives with the drug companies to make um, uh, you know, drugs for neglected diseases. That's been really, really hard. I, I, I just don't think they're structured in a way that will lead to that outcome. And we are still looking for, uh, you know, for a way to get there. So I don't have an answer for you. And, and, and just to say that I spend most of my time trying to help poor countries and poor people figure out how they can fit into the market system in a way that works for them, because that's the ocean we all swim in. Uh, but there are, there are huge market failures, like the one you just mentioned, you know, drugs for neglected diseases, that we've all got to put our minds to. Unfortunately, without market forces, it's very hard. So uh, let me offer Can I part? have one thing, George? Yeah. I know we're doing sort of the, you know, the tag team wrestling, as we say in my culture. Um, but uh, again, you know, the, the experience of these same problems, the ones you mentioned, is very different if, when you're a clinician. I mean, like, I have a number of students here tonight who I'm not that embarrassed to tell you, but I'm, I'm probably going to get in trouble from Jen Pachetti, <laughs> from whom I have just stolen money. Because when I go to a we're, village... We're proud of the fact that the Brigham and Women's Hospital also seeded your organization very early good. on. They did good. <laughs> um, you know, when you, it, Jim's going to meet with the premier of China, right? But I'm going to go to the same village, which looks radically different. But the problem right now is the same. It's user fees to, to send their kids to school. So the things that they were saying before, you know, the, the, the look... When we went there, um, in, when I went there, um, it's a squatter settlement. You saw why. We didn't make the film, by the way. We, you know, we, we just, I guess what's the word? We experienced it. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, 35, yeah, 35 years ago, you know, people in, in the squatter settlement were, were saying, you know, I, I really, my mom's sick or I'm, I'm hungry. Uh, now they're saying, uh, the computer you got me has too little memory. Yeah. Now that's progress. <laughs> that's okay? a good problem That's to have. progress, yes. right? But Let the me, yeah. problems of the market, you know, I we, have no doubt we're swimming in it, but we, the, problems that, uh, uh, the, the problems of the market are very substantial for people. Let me put in a market. plug. Yeah. I, we live in a dynamic biotechnology ecosystem, which... It embraces the fact that financial incentive is a driver of innovation. There's no doubt about that. But we are also privileged to be part of an institution which has resources and which can reward innovation in a way that isn't related to profit. Yeah. And so as long as uh, institutions like Harvard continue to have the resources, we can invest in transforming human health for diseases where there aren't market forces yeah, that will I, work. I just want to echo that because I'm not sure you, anybody who watched this can see um, that this institution is all over it. Um, but, you know, I, I do, and, and this is not a rele relevant to the question at all, but we understood... That's never stopped you yeah, before, well, Paul. Yeah, well, that's so not going to stop me now either. <laughs> um, we understood, I mean, this is the way Jim put it when we were in the MD-PhD, what are we going to make of our ridiculously lavish education? Yes, that was an explicit right. How are you going to discussion, pay which probably went on for years, which is a, you know, I don't want to be part of that anymore. It's too boring, the discussion. But that's just what, so we had different ways of attacking that. You'll have a different way of attacking that. The, you know, the, I mean, there's, there's a, I mean, Carmela Kletchen is here. She, I said to her, well, she said, what do you need? And I said, well, I actually need a professorship in global surgery. surgery. Now, would, I, would we have known that when we were grad school students? That we'd be shilling for a professorship? Um, no, but we learned something in the 35 yes. years since 1983. Well, I have to say those, uh, and, uh, those who invested 
in you and your education to put you through Harvard and be PhD. Thank you, Byron and Mary Jo. The and return Arthur. on the investment of that to the world has been substantial. So can we have another question Thank here, you. please? Hi. Um, We're just getting started. Yeah. <laughs> you ain't eating someone, tonight, George. I, I, I don't know who the adult is in charge of this, uh, yeah. but someone will, at some point, we will decide to conclude and continue the questions outside with the reception. Please. Thank you. Um, I guess my question is, um, in your experience, what is the best way to merge global health as a tool in diplomacy, and I suppose the reverse as well? Oh. Well, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna say something. Jim said it in, in, in the film, and since he's, you know, we're both involved in this. By the way, don't I don't want to make it sound like I'm that that we have again haven't learned a lot over the years as mm -hmm. and you know to to have this as a platform uh, um, a great university is very congenial to me because um, I and I figured that out by almost making a different choice not too long ago now, let me just say it wasn't in the last year or so <laughs> I have no idea what you're talking about I, I was yeah, saying join a well, U.S. administration oh. but oh. Yeah, it wasn't recently oh. so but uh, I knew that I figured out that that would be wrong, uh, wrong for me. Okay. But yeah, you know, look, look at when you talk about joining global health to diplomacy. I have to say, when when Tony Fauci, I mean, I'm not even, I'm not even a bona fide MI, NIH researcher, and you know, I'm I'm sorry for that, George. I'll try <laughs> harder. Um, I'm an anthropologist, clinician, and when he called me and said, uh, you, know, you should come to the the White House the day after tomorrow, I thought, secretly what I thought, I later told him, but he didn't laugh. I mean, I told him the, ne the next day, because I had to get there, mm -hmm. I thought, what if I get like electrocuted when I go through the door, or some <laughs> lightning strikes me or something, right? It's not gonna work. But it did work. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying there weren't problems, but to me, that's linking a, a, a potentially universal interest, which I, this is my impression, that people are interested in justice and equity. And we beat it out of a, uh, each other and out of societies, right? Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean it's not there and it can't be. I'm, I'm still kind of Catholic, as you may have figured out. So that it can't be cultivated. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, that's one kind of diplomacy, right? Um, bringing the powerful um, into the fight mm -hmm. against poverty. Now, it, that, that causes, that's not easy. But it's one form. And when, when you, you know, Jim does it, uh, uh, a very different way, but I, we, we regard these as linked struggles. I, I wonder what you were really asking. Yeah, are, you, are you interested in, in diplomacy? Is that, is that, yeah. Oh, well, that's a good question, too. Stop um, with your Jedi mind, Bricks. <laughs> no, I, well, if I must say, um, I was inspired by your work, and that influenced my studies. I'm a grad student at Northeastern, and I study global studies and international relations. Um, and I'm trying to merge my global health and development concentration with a potential future career in diplomacy mm -hmm. and kind of trying to pursue that middle ground um, in a way that you both also yeah. mentioned in maintaining my own interests but trying to serve the greater good. Sounds like so she needs either a co-op or an internship at the World <laughs> Bank. <laughs> yeah. I got his cell phone send number. Me, yeah. Send me your resume. I'll yeah. make the contact. <laughs> yeah, we, we know people. We know people there. Um, <laughs> let me let me um, let me uh, uh, respond to it this way. All right. So um, uh, I I have become so frustrated uh, with heads of state and ministers of finance specifically in developing countries. Now, Paul Kagame, Agnes Benigajo are absolute outliers. There are very few leaders like that who say, we're, we're going to commit. And in fact, our latest project, uh, 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 they have 38% stunting in, 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 um, in uh, uh, Rwanda. And President Kagame told me, I want it to be zero in three years. Right? And I thought, huh, well, if we did directly observe feeding, and we did directly observe prenatal care, right? why not? We could get the under twos down very low within three years. So I said to my team, okay, I want about $600 million mm -hmm. because we're going to make the point that it's doable, that you can bring stunting down to zero, right? Now, but the thing is, 
He, and I know he's going to push me harder and harder to make the money available and to go. And I'm going to try to give him the money on the cheapest terms possible because we want to make a point. Sure. But for the rest of the world, it's very supply driven. Okay, so, so it's, not, it's not like we need to, to, to make our, our people healthier and more educated. They'll, in a meeting, they'll all say it, mm -hmm. and their budgets for health and education are tiny, minuscule. And what Rwanda's they're doing is putting over 20% of its public budget into healthcare. But, but extremely rare. Uh, and so what they're saying basically is, well, okay, if you want to give us money for HIV, TB, and malaria, we'll, we'll treat it. But if you stop giving us money, we'll stop treating it. So along with um, uh, another uh, classmate of ours from an internship, Chris Murray, we're doing something called the Human Capital Index. Because you need to make it hurt for heads of state and ministers of finance that if they don't invest in health and education, mm -hmm. we're going to make it public, we're going to rank countries, we're going to say, hey, people, your country is behind this country you always thought you were ahead of, right? And I'm, let me just tell you, it's going to be the same thing. People are going to be so pissed off at me for doing it. They're going to get so angry. And, and you know, the people that come out looking good are going to be happy. The people who come out looking bad are going to be angry. But I've just come to the conclusion that there's no way we're going to reach universal health coverage unless heads of state and ministers of finance are desperately scared mm -hmm. of the ranking coming out and not moving up. And so, so for me, that's my diplomacy, right? And, and uh, they, they're only, the only uh, organization in the world that can link health, education, and social protection to economic growth is us, right? And I kept asking, why have we never done that before? And everyone in the bank said, oh, you can't do that. I said, why? Oh, it'll be so controversial. Well, then what'll happen? People will be so angry, right? So it's like you saw in the movie, so what else is new, right? <laughs> uh, I, I, think, I think that this is going to be the key. Right? That th there's just no way, no matter how generous people are, there's no way that we're going to get to universal health coverage for everyone um, uh, un un until, until it really costs them something. Now, the thing that's going to be very interesting is I think that the Human Capital Index will affect foreign direct investment decisions. Mm -hmm. And if, if people start saying, whoa, we had no idea that the workforce here in the future is going to be so weak, um, maybe we should invest somewhere else. If foreign direct investment starts going down, then what happens is their bond rating, which in, in other words, you know, the rate at which they can borrow on capital markets, goes up. Mm -hmm. Now, the one thing that will wake up a head of state and a minister of finance is if their borrowing costs go up. Right? So this is my grand experiment. I'm giving my first uh, uh, speech on this in a couple of weeks. It's going to be incredibly controversial, mm -hmm. but we're going to hold people accountable. And, uh, because you know, it, it's important to hold donors accountable. We need more donor money, but without the powerful people in the countries, you know, afraid of not doing it, uh, they, 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 um, uh, they won't do it. And so what I hope to do is to create tremendous demand for you guys, all of you in this room who are doing global health, for, for Paul and others. They're going to say, oh my God, we've got to get our numbers better. We need your help. Can you, can you come and help us? That's what, that's what we need to do. Let's take another question over here, please. First of all, thank you so much for being here. Uh, my name is Taehyung Kim, and I'm currently a medical student here at Harvard. Um, I run a nonprofit organization that's operating in North Korea. Um, most recently, <coughs> we're working on the issue of HIV AIDS. Um, the official position by the government is that there is no HIV AIDS case, um, but certainly the circumstances are different on the ground. Um, going back to your experience in Peru, um, when you were told by government officials that you'd be kicked out. Um, I'm facing a similar d dilemma in terms of if you disseminate any information or data in terms of what's going on in the country, um, we'll accept your treatment, but um, we're giving you a very stern warning. Um, so how did you navigate those circumstances and did you have any general guiding principles in terms of um, how to navigate those political circumstances and any advice would be much appreciated. Well, Peru was not a nuclear power, so that was... <laughs> yeah, that, Thank that you. Was <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, you know, I just say, hey, you know, I, I have relatives. And uh, um, my father uh, escaped when he was 19, and, mm -hmm. and all his brothers and sisters are still there. So, uh, you know, um, thank you for doing what you're doing. Uh, but, y you know, it's just hard to know what's going on there. I mean, and, and I'm in Washington. I know all the 
the, the, the greatest experts on what's happening there, and really it's just, it's a mystery. You know, we don't really know what's going on. So, um, uh, you know, another one of our colleagues, KJ, right, is uh, treating. I called KJ. Yeah. Hey, dude. Yeah. When you need to tell KJ to call him back. Okay. Again, um, it's funny K KJ, when you KJ have a doing few billion MD. dollars handy, what you can do. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we, we don't work in, in North Korea, um, and, and, uh, uh, but if things really opened up, uh, we'd probably be the first organization there. And so, you know, I've talked to the Chinese authorities about this, and they'd love us, they'd love for the World Bank to go there, but the North ha would have to do certain things. They'd have to open their country up, they'd have to share data with us, we'd have to agree on what the data is. So it's, a, it's, I, 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 it's just a really hard situation, very personally painful for me. I'd say, you know, just thank you for, for continuing to try. And I, I think the one person who knows more about healthcare in Korea than really anyone in the world outside of North Korea is KJ, uh, KJ Sung, one of our who colleagues. Who is on the faculty of HMS. Yeah, he's on the faculty of HMS. And, and yeah. I promised Tay already to connect them. The question he asked you wasn't that, which, so now I'm gonna actually answer the question he asked Jim. <laughs> Thank um, you. I wanna say this, and, and we, we started to have this conversation you know, in, in my office um, uh, before a conference um, that we had sponsored in the department, that it was very painful. When we were watching this, we were sitting next to each other, which it's just, I, Jim leaned over and said those were just such dark times. And I gotta say, and Carol Mitnick, is she still here? And Meche, Mercedes Becerra, and who, they were students then. You know, Sonia Shin, who you saw there, she looks like she's 12. She still annoyingly looks like she's 12. <laughs> she's a, these are all Harvard faculty, senior yeah. faculty now. Yeah. And it was just brutal, you know, because let me also say something that still pains us, um, and, I'm, and Jim included, is that the authorities in Peru, unlike North Korea, they were getting their advice from our peers at the World Health Organization. At the mm -hmm. World Health Organization. Who had <laughs> trained yeah. in universities like this one. And remember, Jaime told me specifically. He said, go he to said, Geneva. He said, oh, you know, meetings. he said, we cannot fight these guys here. You have to go to Geneva and fight them there. Mm -hmm. right? So wow. I, it's, and it's wow. different. And Pajo, too. Yeah. yeah. But that, was, that, that, was, that was true there. So it might not, but we'll just make sure and connect you. We'll, yeah. try, to, we'll try to get a couple sure. more quick questions in, and we'll, please. Thank you. My name is... Babatunde, I'm a Nigerian, an um, obstetrician and gynecologist trained in Nigeria. I'm presently, I'm a second year master student at the HMS. Now, my question is in terms of maternal mortality, uh, because where I'm from Africa, where we have the highest level of maternal mortality rates in, in the world, particularly my country, is the second highest maternal mortality rate in the world, where 814 women per 100,000 die because of pregnancy and childbirth, which is not a disease. So I want to know if Partners in Health has any kind of collaboration, because I know you work in HIV, you work in TB, you work in Ebola, non-communicable disease like yeah. maternal Internal health. health. Let, me, let me just say one quick thing. Answer. Let me just quick say, answer. quick, me? No. Yes. Um, <laughs> that, that's misleading. Partners in Health has never been a vertical program yeah. focused yeah. on. It's just focused on what ails poor people. So. Maternal mortality has always been a, a, a primary concern. Um, and we, we, should, we should talk about some of the specific programmatic interventions. Um, but, but to bring this back to the previous question that Tay asked, um, and to be a little bit fresh about it and brief, um, the idea that a public health Luddite, I didn't say public health, I said public health Luddite approach is going to solve a problem like maternal mortality is not true, yeah. right? Because for some, it basically, if someone, so you know, there are too many C-sections here. In rural areas of Nigeria, rates of C-section probably are zero, right? If there's no electricity, how can there be a C-section? Um, so these, these, the, the, what's, what, is, what is being done, yeah, you need prenatal care. Who's disputing that? You need family planning. Even a good Catholic boy like me knows that, right? But obstructed labor requires a blood bank and an operating room. And until you take this radically in egalitarian approach, say, what would I want for my wife, my sister, you know, my daughter, 
um, if she had obstructive labor? The answer is very clear. And unfortunately, we have now decades of uh, poor leadership on complex health yeah, issues. Absolutely. Poor yeah. How about over here, please? And I will apologize. I think this will be our last question. And I hope that you'll stay around for a bit to have some personal questions up front. Please. Thank you. Uh, I'm Georg, a pediatric oncologist from Armenia. Uh, my question is about, there is a huge, uh, you mentioned HIV, tuberculosis, and, uh, but now there is a, a huge disparity also in cancer. And what, cancer. Yeah, and what's your, and the disparity is actually growing. And what's your vision on, on, on this problem? And also, uh, I, uh, you, you said you need to think uh, big to make the things true, and I want to ask, would you visit also Armenia? <laughs> well, let me, let me, cancer, let me just again say Paul, what, what I just said. Paul, Paul promises to, to our, visit Armenia, right? Yeah. How do you know I haven't been to Yerevan? Um, what I just said, again, we've had very poor leadership in policy. Right, over decades, right? Because I'm not saying in Armenia, actually it's gotten worse in Armenia since the collapse of the Soviet Union. And well, I hope it's better now. But I mean, in terms of the equity guidelines, right? So I'll, I'll, I'll just say, I went to a conference with Harvard faculty and many others, Larry Shulman from the Brigham, other advocates, Felicia Knoll who was here then, lots of advocates from Harvard, Dana Farber of the Brigham, to a conference on cancer care in the developing world. All right, That's the, that was the title of the concert. I mean, concert. Although Lance concert, Armstrong did yeah. ask me if I wanted to ride a bike with him, and I said, no, I do not care to ride bikes. <laughs> but uh, the, the person representing the, the main standard-setting body of the world, already mentioned by Jim, and in this film about a million times, whose portfolio is cancer care in developing countries, said to me, and in, uh, in earshot of many others, but you don't really believe that's possible in Africa, do you? Like, hey man, that's your, I mean, hey man or woman, that's your job, right? That's your title. But, but here, now that's what I mean by public here, health. Here, here's the other part. Here's the it, other part. It is right? possible. Here's the other part. So we now know, uh, and and this this research that that Chris Murray is doing, is going to show uh, that if we don't aggressively improve health outcomes and educational outcomes in the developing countries these countries are going to potentially collapse. And so, it, you know, if you, it, it, when they come to us, they all want a road, especially a road that goes back to their hometown, right? Because roads get them votes. But this is our meeting. Right? You know, well, but, but, but uh, what, I, what, I, what I'm saying is, you, you know, we have not done a good enough job. And we, we always knew this. The reason I was part of, uh, uh, it, it, I, we, Paul and I both participated in something called 50 Years is Enough in which we uh, argued that the World Bank and uh, IMF should be closed on their 50th anniversary in 1994. I was part of that. I was, uh, I was part of that. And I, you know, when I went to interview with President Obama, I said, you know, I was part of this movement to close the bank. Is that, does that disqualify me? He goes, no, it's okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but our, our objection was that you're looking at economic growth too narrowly, right? And with automation, with artificial intelligence, with technology, uh, the, the uh, premium on healthy, educated people is going to go up and up and up every year. Right? And so uh, what we are trying to do is to say, please don't think of health and education as afterthoughts after you've done the real stuff on economic growth, which is roads and energy and you know, um, uh, agriculture or whatever. You've got to do this almost first. And the, the correlation between countries that have invested in health and education and growth are just stunning, you know, stronger than we'd expected coming out of here, right? So I think the way to do it is that everyone in Armenia has to read this stuff and say, hey, wait a minute, why, why are the people just across the border, um, you know, getting cancer care and we're not? And, and, and you know, it, this is terrible. We're, you know, uh, we're ranked below Bangladesh. There's one major huge country that's going to come out ranked below Bangladesh. They're not going to like it very much and the people aren't going to like it, right? And so we have to keep saying, the, the, the path toward a prosperous, um, uh, uh, successful society is investing in your people. But then, th then the people in the country have to demand it. And then these folks who now, in addition to being practicing oncologists um, you know, at the hospitals in, in, in the Harvard area, 
who also now started thinking about how to deliver oncological care in developing countries, the demand for them will go up. So my prediction is that the demand for people who are, uh, who, who, who are good at making these programs work will go up dramatically, I hope, over the next few years. And it's quite remarkable. Thank you you mentioned Larry Shulman, my colleague Leslie Lehman yeah, Leslie. has also gone to, to Rwanda. The fact that we can uh, take you know, standard risk childhood leukemia yeah. and cure it 90% of the time, and yet the similar disease has a devastating prognosis in parts of Africa is a, a travesty. And yet what she's learned is that even without the elaborate support systems of blood transfusion and antibiotics and all that, in the under-resourced area, you can make a difference. You might not be able to achieve 90%, but 60, 70%, and that's working. And then with the knowledge of how to impose that type of success in this under-resourced area, she can come back to the Dana-Farber and teach us how to do our own medicine better, more efficiently, yeah. and cheaper. In, in, Rwanda, in Rwanda, there is um, a company called Zipline that, cre that, uh, that makes drones. And, and for the first time in history, and again, it's Rwanda, for the first time in history, drones are being used to deliver blood products. So now uh, uh, you, can, you can get blood to just about every health center in Rwanda with these little airplanes that they, they look like, you know, sort of, uh, they made them out of balsa wood or right. something. They, they yeah. look, the, and, and so you can get Gleevec to anywhere yes. in the world. You don't need to store it, right? And I just talked to these guys who were working around. They said that not only have they saved, 30% of their blood deliveries have been emergencies for things like, uh, like, like C-sections, right? For, for uh, uh, to prevent maternal mortality. But not only that, they said, but because the health centers are under so much pressure, not, not, it's not on yes anymore, but the same team, under so much pressure not to waste drugs, that these, uh, that the w drug wastage has dropped almost to nothing. Because they don't need to stock things anymore, right? Within 20 minutes, you can get anything anywhere uh, in, in, uh, in Rwanda. So that's the kind of thing uh, that I, I think should happen in the future. Because look, you know, when we, when, when, when we hear them say, Tukmun Semun, which is all humans are human, right? A very simple idea, but what that means is, is pretty awesome to think about. Everyone has to have uh, health care, including for cancer, for surgery, for everything. Everyone has to have access to the best possible education. This is a huge task. This is a huge, huge task. But there's nothing short of that that it's going to prevent us from having a society that no one will want to live in uh, with so many people left out. Right? So that, uh, that, that's the message for all of you. Do the stuff that you love, yes. but always carve out a piece of your brain that thinks, what, what could happen uh, if we applied this in developing countries? You know, George, uh, 10 years ago, asked me to be on the board of the International Society for Stem Cell Research. And I said, George, what on earth, why on earth would you want me to do that? And it's exactly what he said. He said, I want stem cell researchers to carve out a piece of their brain to think about what is it that we're doing that might be useful and beneficial in developing countries. That's the same for all of you. Don't, you know, Everyone says, I want to be like Paul, right? And, and look, I, I well, spent... get me the damn money. I spent, I spent about... <laughs> I, spent, I spent about a year thinking that myself. And I thought, no, no, no way, right? You're, you're not... Very few people are going to be like Paul. But the point is, the point is, if we do the right thing, you can do the things you love here and also have a huge impact on this major project, which is still, and has been for a long time, the project is human solidarity. How, how do we live together with each other and with this planet in a way that we don't kill each other? This is, this is a major, major issue. And you guys, I think, can be at the core of solving that problem. Here, yeah. here, yeah. here, here. My sense is, my sense is that uh, many in the audience will want to be like Paul, and many in the audience will want to be like you, Jim. Uh, I think both of you share the passion that where there's a will, there's a way. It, it has been uh, humbling and inspiring to, uh, to be in the presence of these two remarkable individuals.
they have taught us that we don't have to compromise, that we need to continue to aspire to do better. Thank you so much. Thank you for all you have done in the movement that you started, and thank you for being here with us tonight. Thank you. Great.